And on occasion, as we're shooting a TV show, quote unquote, undercover in these hotel rooms, you know, a housekeeper would, would not knock or we didn't hear her knock, would key into a room. And I mean, if you're a housekeeper and you come in, there's a couple checked into the room and you see 14 people with lights and cameras in a room. <laughs> what do you think is going on in that room? You know, sorry. <laughs> Welcome, Jeff. Thank you for joining me today. It's great to see you. It's been too many years. If we did the math, what is it? 25, 30, something. A long time yeah. since since we uh, got together. We met back in college doing a singing group, Cayuga's Waiters. And yeah, it was a strange and different time. Definitely interested to hear about how your experience then compares to now. But maybe start off, give me a little intro about yourself. What, do you, what have you been up to for the last number of years <laughs> you want me to consolidate several decades into a uh into a into a couple seconds because it feels like a, we, we've been out of school i think more than we were in school right for like, sure we were, we, were, we were so it does feel it does feel like a long time ago and at the same time it feels like it was yesterday isn't that weird why is that why do we like that time even though it's just four years of our life it, it Sticks so much, right? You grow up so much. Then I think it does. I think it does for a lot of people. I think that's what that's what colleges and universities bank on, right? When they call you up for donations, they bank <laughs> on that. It was so formative. You know, I think back on on so our collective time, right? Like you and me and the waiters and singing as the happiest time that I had in college. So you know, forget fraternity and girlfriends and all that stuff. Put that stuff aside. When I think about it, and I try and identify what was it about singing with a bunch of dudes, you know, three times a week, twice a week, whatever we did, unlike a fraternity or something like that, we actually created something together, right? There was actually a product for what we did. We, we, we all came from these different paths and different majors and all that stuff. But like when we came together, we actually produced something together. It's painful to me that we can't go back and do that again. Um, and the group doesn't exist anymore, but at the same time, it's locked in my brain as, as just such a wonderful time. Hmm. Yeah. And it was totally voluntary. Unlike, I mean, a fraternity is voluntary too, but it's also like your living arrangement There's something special about like you dedicated your time to it without anyone telling you you needed to, you weren't getting any grades for it. No one else cared that you're doing it. It's just, just your choice we made music. Like we, we stood up, we did, we got like, it was a risk we all took too, right? We stepped out on the stage as a bunch of dudes, you know, the times it went really well and the times where we're looking at each other from across the shoe saying, what just happened? Like, you know, you know, those slow slides into Flatville. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was just, it was just such a, it was just such a great time. Yeah. So you asked me where, where I've been. I, I went to hotel school at the time in, in, you know, in 1997, you and I are the same, the same year, right? At the time, it was, you know, everyone was vying for a position at an investment bank or real estate firm or, you know, well-paying management consultancy. Hmm. And so I felt like I had to do the same thing. And so I worked for a REIT, a real estate investment trust, and it just wasn't for me. Um, it just wasn't for me. I wasn't meant to be behind a stack of spreadsheets. I, I was really meant to be out in front of clients and either selling or doing things or at least, you know, having something a little bit more... Um, extroverted than, than, than crunching numbers in a, in an Excel model. Yeah. Uh, so that didn't last long. Uh, 9-11 happened, which also changed things. I was living in DC at the time working for this REIT. Um, my that was like, I was like just a couple weeks into work for me. Yeah. I was like, that was like the yeah. weirdest way or the first few days or something. The weirdest way to start your career yeah. is like everybody stopped working and was just sitting in front of the TV. And, and for me personally, like I was living in DC, really didn't know very many people. My, my social group, all landed in New York City. I was really one of very few in DC. I lived alone. It was like painfully lonely. Um, and to be going through all that by myself, I'm like, I, I think I got to get out of here. Mm -hmm. So I lasted a year. Uh, it was fine. I learned a lot. And then I started, I started working for the firm I work for now called Coil Hospitality Group. I met, uh, it was started by a fellow Cornell guy, 1987. I think Jim graduated in 1987. We were connected through a, a fellow Cornell person we both knew. Hmm. And the company had started just shortly shortly before. And it was uh, it was mystery shopping, which we'll go into in more depth, which is a form of field research, market research, but really centered around restaurants and hotels only at the time. And it was, you know, providing feedback. And I did that for a while. I then went to go work for a competitor. I got a very good offer to go work for a competitor of Coil's. 
I had an interesting year where I auditioned and got cast in a very early days travel show. It wasn't a reality show. I was a host of the show with two others where we traveled the world and checked into hotels and provided feedback, much like what I do in my professional life, but on TV. Yeah. Uh, I like to think that TV show is a little bit ahead of its time. <laughs> so it didn't, it didn't, it didn't last all but one season, but, uh, Boy, that was uh, that was a lot of fun as well. It's traveling around with a TV crew um, and making TV for a year. From what I know of you from back in school, everything seems like a great fit for you. Of yeah, talking to people, BSing, and showing off things, and it felt very natural. Uh, a little ahead of its time, it was fun. I, I met I met some very interesting people. I wish I could do it all over again because I was very young, <laughs> and I think I think a lot of what I had to say was was quite naive. Um, and I would have done it differently, but I guess maybe that's true for everybody. You look back on things, they would have approached it a little differently. And then I came back and I eventually through a few other careers and advertising and some other things, I landed back at Coil and I've, I've been working for Coil and running the company for, um, the better part of the last probably about 15 years and growing the company. And so that's, yeah. that's where I am today. It's incredible. So when I was in business school, we did a, a branding project for Coil or in yeah. my market research class, or maybe it was the brand immersion. I don't know. It was like one of our big projects of the thing. You only get a couple of these in your in your years there of getting to work with some external company. And so Coil was one of the companies that came in and said, you know, yeah, we'll pay to do a project with these idiot kids, you know. And uh, so we like interviewed a bunch of their customers and and you know tried to figure out what is the Coil brand and and then you know so we did this market research project and then spat out some results and some strategy that I'm sure like you know like you said, being naive and all this, I look back on that and think like, man, if I hired these NBA kids or I've, I've done that later on at Intel um, and like, you know, they produce something good, but it's like, uh, is it really going to change? It's not going to change the company in a big way. Although that was different. Like at Intel, it is a big company. We're doing a lot of big research. Maybe Coil, it's like a pretty rare that you get these occasions to get some feedback from an unbiased party. I think so, and I think one of the out, one of the things that you guys created. And this was this was early, so when I rejoined the company, it happened to be the couple of years you were gone. I think is, is correct. When I was working. And, I, yeah. and I remember, I remember one of the things that that I think was one of the findings that you had was around our narratives. Right, the company has since grown, and we handle clients that are outside of hospitality. Right, so we handle a lot of retail brands and automotive brands and other things, but. Going back in time to when you were involved, is really, really focused around hospitality. And so mm -hmm. much of hospitality is story. It's very much about an experience. And we write an experience in narratives, right? I walked into the front desk. I was approached by so-and-so. I checked in. This is what happened. And we still, to this day, write these ex or have the evaluators write these extensive narratives. Mm. I think one of the things that you highlighted and your team highlighted was like, that the clients felt that was trem of tremendous value and nobody else in our industry was doing that. Hmm. Like the competitors, the competitors were really sticking to very uh, bullet point lists, summary comments, um, and that you guys felt like that was a real differentiator hmm. and something we should lean into and continue to do. And we do to this day, and I believe that to be very true, which is maybe why, why we've had such longevity with our clients. Very cool. Very so cool. thanks for that, Ian. Thank you. Oh, you're thanks welcome. You. <laughs> Hopefully, smart, it was something smart, about smarter than you. Smarter than you remember back then as a kid. <laughs> we got. I think we got an A. You know, we did. We did, yeah. did okay in that project. Um, yeah. Usually, at the end of these interviews, I talk about AI and you know ask people to like say how it's impacting their industry. But this kind of feels like the right time that there's two ways I see it applying to that specific problem, and I think maybe we could talk later about it, like in travel in general, I'd maybe lo I'd love, to, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Truly go. Yeah. It's what I focus on a ton. And you know, yeah. one of the big things I care about and try to use all these AI tools uh, to help produce this podcast and do all the other projects I do, but I could definitely see it in that narrative element of LLMs. The AI, you know, modern AI tools are great at reading all that stuff at compressing it down at understanding it at, you know, pulling in a whole bunch of these things and trying to, they're not so good at this yet, but, um, coming up with themes across a bunch of things or, you know, some of that work of taking all these interviews and sticking them down into a report that a client can grok, it, you know, makes a lot of sense. How have you guys seen it possibly be applicable yet? A couple, a couple of things come to mind and, and knowing that your background with market research, 
one of the things that I've been sold as a market research firm, for all intents and purposes, that's what I do. Um, I, I was constantly sold for years around text analytics, right? Mm. Companies would approach all the time saying, listen, you guys are sitting on tomes yeah. of this narrative. Help us, you know, and I remember firms like Clara Bridge was one that comes to mind. I'm sure there were many others. Um, and no, the ones that we demoed, and for our purposes, it was somewhat limiting because, again, the narratives that we produce are different than verbatims that are coming in from real customers. We have a protocol on how these should be written, so they're not free form by any means. Um, but in any event, the software always seemed clunky, right? It always seemed, for example, you know, you'd look at one that was demoed for me was in you know, hotels in New York City, and they said, oh, a big problem you have is small rooms. It's like, well, every hotel in New York City has small rooms. <laughs> small rooms isn't necessarily a bad thing in New York. It, it, it's, you know, because it didn't have the awareness that AI would bring, right? That there's a market and saying, all the rooms are small. That's not really a pertinent thing now. So let's focus on others. So that would be interesting to me from a text analytics with an, with an AI smartness, if you will, applied to it. Does that, does that help in, in sort of the old days of codifying you know, verbatims and having someone actually key in the themes and all that. I imagine there's a huge amount of time savings and efficiencies there. Yeah, that's an interesting idea, that contextual understanding of like what's a problem or not a problem, what's actually different from the norm that the AI or, you know, these, a language model could have an understanding of what the normal is. Well, I mean, yeah, I sat there, I sat there with like a, a social media company that was touting all this, this text analytics, and we're going to read your reviews. And you know, the number one theme was small rooms. I'm like, okay, great. Yeah, like great. by, that was probably mentioned a lot. By the number of mentions, that is a big one, yes. Sure, and, and when I'm comparing that against like properties from Omaha and Columbus, Ohio, yep, you're right, the rooms are small. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. So, so I think there's some interesting things there. For my business purposes, I'm in the business of sending human beings, right? Yeah, I have hundreds of thousands of human beings that are independent contractors all over the world in seventy plus countries. And what do they do? And, well, what is mystery shopping? We didn't really say. So mystery mystery shopping is a form of field research, right? And field research means I, I have individuals that are actually out in the field and they are experience having experiences like real customers do and reporting back in a structured way. So. It can happen, and and it can happen across all different types of of experiences. And why so, does a company want that to happen, or what? Yeah, why do they hire you to do that? Companies hire mystery shoppers for several reasons. A mystery shopper, for you know, if you had a franchise business, your mystery shoppers are probably looking at compliance, right? So if you're Taco Bell or you're McDonald's or you're something like that, or you're a gas station or a convenience store, you're looking to see that certain signage was present certifications are done, cleanliness, condition. Oh, they have the new hot dog they're promoting. They've got up the new Halloween signage for spooktacular drinks. Great. We need that. So you're, you're taken off the list. If you are a business, and I just got off the phone prior to you, I'm talking to a business that is a super high-end women's apparel business, opening up their first flagship store in New York City, right? It's very high-end fashion. And so they're based outside the U.S. And so they need to make sure that the experience in their store is top notch no matter what day of the week because they're remote. They can't be here. So it's a little softer. Sure, they have certain standards of how you're supposed to approach a customer when he or she walks in. But generally speaking, they're looking at it more experiential. Like, is it friendly? Are people nice? Are people welcoming? What's the music like? What's the scent like? And so they'd be hiring us for, for less compliance and a little bit more experience. Hmm. And then folks will hire us for competitive analysis. You know, see, hey, when I, when I walk into an electronic store and I'm shopping for a new PC and the Best Buy employee walks up to me, which one are they recommending first? Right? I'm in the market for a new computer. Great. Who's it for? It's for me. Yeah. Okay. Here's what I'd recommend and why. Right? Yeah. So brands are, you know, obviously brands want, you know, want to be aware of what that is. That happens a lot in a lot of businesses where there's a consideration set and brands want to know how they stack up when asked by a customer. Um, so those are some of the reasons. That, but how mystery shopping gets done expanded based on the internet. So when, when I joined the company in 2001, to a large extent, we were using the Cornell directory to find people in markets. Like we go through and say, hey, we need someone in Miami. 
who do we know in Miami? Oh, and um, there's just a little a gig job. You know, yeah, the, hey, the Bob, early I, gig jobs. I graduated with you a few years ago, you know, hey, but it was all over telephone or email. And in fact, at the time, individuals, after they completed this report, right? So we sent them into a restaurant or we sent them to a hotel or they went into a store. They were fax us back the actual information typewritten. Yeah. Um, we had typing templates that they had to use and they type it because then we would just edit it and we'd send it on to the client directly, that faxed material. And then email happened. And then, then the internet happened and social networks in quotes happened and mm. allowed us to really recruit all over the world. And that, that allows us to have hundreds of thousands of individuals now in, in you know, 70 some odd countries that we can deploy in a moment's notice. So if you needed somebody to shop a restaurant in Azerbaijan tonight, you know, we, we could make that happen very quickly. Wow. Uh, and that, that's, that's pretty amazing. So a lot of times brands help us innovate as well, right? You know, what would you do? And it's like, you have a workforce of smart market researchers. These people are doctors, they're lawyers, they're business people, they're musicians, you name it. They're all over the world right now. You could do, you could really leverage them to do whatever you want them to do. What do you want them to do? And so sometimes when confronted that brands are like, God, it'd be really interesting to find this out. Hmm. So that is a little bit about what mystery shopping is, but it, it, it does take on a lot of different flavors. That's a super interesting and relating it back to the AI topic we were talking about. Most of that is nothing that AI can touch, right? Like you, it's physical bodies moving into places, asking questions, going up to the, the clerk and trying to prompt them with something that the brand wants them to have a good response to and seeing if they have it. You may look back on this and this may, this may be a horribly dated statement I'm about to make, but it's like if user generated reviews didn't kill mystery shopping or what I do, then AI isn't. Yeah. And, and the reason that I think user reviews, and that was a big threat for a while is user generated content. Like, Hey, why do I need to pay you? I get this, I get this for free. Yeah. Yelp right? is full of a thousand you know, things. Right. Mm-hmm. Everyone tells me what I want. TripAdvisor or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, the, the re- there's a lot of reasons why. And I think if you've traveled recently and relied on even Google reviews or anything, I think there's a tremendous amount of fraudulent activity on those to begin with. I mean, as I go to these places, I'm saying someone's gaming the system, right? These reviews seem a little little too good. You know, it happens once or twice. You say, all right, bad luck. It happens every time you start to really wonder. So I think there's some gamification of that by, mm-hmm. the, by the players. But moreover, a customer will be able to tell you, hey, the service was good or wasn't good or the food tasted good or didn't taste good. A mystery shopper or reviewer is going to tell you why. They're going to say the service wasn't good because... My, my appetizer took 20 minutes to be delivered to the table. And by the way, the menu mentioned it was supposed to come with artichoke and it didn't. So there's much more specificity and you can, you can have an evaluator. We call them evaluators. You can have a mystery shopper act out a scenario that you would never be able to do with a customer, right? So you want them to, you want them to lodge a complaint, send back a meal, work with a client in Miami who gets riddled with noise complaints because they have a nightclub in their in their basement. Mm. So, hey, Jeff, when we're in, every time we're in, I want a guest from the room to call down at two o'clock in the morning and complain about noise, and I want to see how my staff handles it. So, sure enough, every night, 2 a.m., rings a front desk. Hey, the noise is unbearable. What can you do about it? Because they want the staff to be in practice of how they're going to deal with that issue with real customers. Mm. So we help to short circuit that, right? We They can practice on us, not on their real customers. That's an interesting one too, like the, as a training method or a, yeah, keeping, yeah, so keeping AI, the pencils AI, sharp. AI is, I don't see how AI is going to do that. What I worry about is AI is, you know, I worry to some extent um, AI homogenizing perhaps some of the responses that we're receiving in as market researchers, right? So like, you know, like we're only as good as our respondents. And so I have great respondents. I think the temptation for a lot of industries is that a lot of the written material we get in this world, at some point in the near future, if it's not already, is going to be run through some sort of AI generator, right? Yeah. I just saw I just saw something promoted to me on, on TikTok, which is a video of a girl doing an interview on Zoom, a job interview on Zoom. And she had some AI tool next to her that I guess listens in and prompts with like the best response to an interview question you can give. Uh. Sounds so like, great. I mean, so like, <laughs> Sounds- they give you that absurd question, like, right? you know, give me this time. And, and she's glancing over to what's basically a, an AI generated a prompter. 
Yeah, giving her like, oh, this story would be. I, I know your your ten stories you have. Try this story and go from this bent, or like just a little bit of prompting. You can't read off the thing, right? But yeah, that's both scary and the kind of tool you want as an individual. Like every individual is going to want that kind of thing. Or I have a, I don't know if it's a disability or whatever, but it's like a. I am terrible at remembering people's names and coming up with them like when I meet new people. I remember all kinds of weird facts about everything. I can see an image from a movie. I'm like really good at that game of like, you see that one picture of the movie and you can immediately come up with a title. For some reason, my brain is insanely good at that kind of thing. But when I see my friends, people I've met a whole bunch of times, I have to like really think about it. So I would love some glasses or whatever that just popped up, you know, just help me with that. Where just got it? rid of this, you know? Yeah. I thought those glasses came out years ago. Where are they? They're not quite. They're not quite here yet. You know, Facebook has these new ones that uh, they look like Ray Bans uh, that are pretty nice, and they have some AI stuff built into them, and they have a camera. So, like, they'll probably be real close to that happening. They don't have the display, so it would still be like an audio type thing. You know, maybe it could it whispers the person's name, right? It has the camera that's always going, maybe, and like in the does the face Pro- recognition. Devil wears Prada. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, right. Like they just kind of come up to you. That, oh, yeah. <laughs> Just so you know that you right. met them last That's week. Not, it's going to be very interesting. I, I tell you, it's like, I think teachers probably, whatever the tools were that were created for plagiarism, I mean, what are they, what is that, what happens there, right? Because the AI in theory could create something completely unique, but still plagiarize. Like, how's that ever going to work? I've been asking a lot of people about that. And uh, my last guest asked that specific question about schooling. And he was saying that the schooling just has to change. You know, the way we test people, the way we teach things, you know, we'll just have to shift. But I do worry about it or think about it a bunch. And I have uh, some more guests coming up that are in the education space. I'll definitely be paying them on this. Let me ask you this, because you're coming from a much more technology background than I am. Um, What's the most exciting thing about AI? And, And what's the most terrifying thing about AI right now, as you sit here today in 2023? So most exciting stuff, I just love how I get to accelerate some of the things that I'm trying to do. It's questionable about the quality of some of it, but some of these things that are um, very challenging to get started, like looking at the blank page or, you know, I'm writing children's books. I wrote one last year and then I'm, I'm trying to start a whole series of them. And, you know, it can do that task like so well, like disturbingly well as, as in like maybe you're not necessary anymore right? Like people could just write their children's books on demand. Just, you know, it's already very good at it. And you can imagine if it, yeah, as it gets better in the next year or two, it's like, that's the scary part is like, do these jobs just go away? Is it even useful to go write these books? But, you know, I can prompt it with my style, my stuff I want, and it will, the the books I'm writing are like alphabet books. So each letter of the alphabet has something related to the topic. And, you know, it can come up with that list instantaneously of, here are the here are ten words that are similar to that topic, and then I can pick from them and I can write something about it or have it write write the first draft of everything. I did find or I have found that the things I have it write, I end up spending a whole bunch of time editing them and making them better. And you know, even though it it feels like what it spits out is a polished product and like ready to go book and like wow that's incredible. It's it's mostly incredible because it takes three seconds. Mm-hmm. Like as you actually get into it, it's like, oh, I could make this better. I could do that better. I can fix that. I can, you know, make the tone better across these. There's all these ways that um, that I continue to edit on it. So that's the positive part, I guess. It doesn't feel that crazy scary yet. Like it's not really doing the whole thing for me. But yeah, the scary part is how does it really change the future? Are we? <laughs> what is, What is left after... Uh, you don't need that kind of knowledge work job. And, you know, there's some robot that can do some the manual labor stuff run by the similar AI. Um, and how do you discern it? And what like, else are we left to do? How do you discern what what's what's machine produced or robot produced and what's human being? I mean, are we going to have, like you would open up a magazine and have a section of, you know, advertorial where it says this is an advertisement. Are there going to be disclaimers on these things that someone's like, this is written by a, human being and this is written by a machine yeah yeah amazon on their book publishing thing has a checkbox like if your work was created with ai which i can understand there's definitely people that are using the tool to just dump things on there but it's like 
to write any text, as you said, you're going to be using these tools. Like anytime yeah. you need to write a block of text, you're going to be running it through an LM because it's just like an editor or a you know, proofreader or it punches yeah. it up or make, changes the tone to sound better, makes it more clear, whatever. Now, now should you be checking that? Like, are you an AI or did you write that? Who, who did it? Yeah, I don't know. Well, maybe we get off of the AI topic yeah, a moment. Yeah, that sure. was nice. To, I saw your son just popped in for a moment. That was nice to see him. What's what's your work situation like these days and post uh, pandemic and everything? Or are you guys I, at home all the time? I've always worked from home. So when everyone else came home, it was like they're invading my office. Um, <laughs> I've always worked from a coil. We, we've always, we've always worked from home. I will give uh, Jim Coyle, the owner, a lot of credit. And I think he recognized very early when he started the business, the benefit of a work from home. And particularly at the time in, in hiring a lot of what were then stay at home moms, folks who might've been in part of the professional workforce had stopped to raise a family, but were still smart, able-bodied, willing and able, but had schedules that weren't really conducive to working in an office nine to five. Yeah. So we tapped into that early days and were able to hire some wonderful people that for whatever reason, weren't able to go back to a traditional office. And, and we really maintained that work at home. We had, you know, opportunities to open up an office and said, what is that going to give us versus how is that going to hinder us? Um, and so we've always been work from home. And after the pandemic, the biggest shift has been is that now I don't hide the fact that we're work from home. I celebrate it. For yeah, a while, it was, like, it was like, where are you based? Oh, we're, we're in New York. And we have a we have a Madison Avenue mailing address. But there is no office. You go to that office, it's a mailbox, et cetera. You know, <laughs> I mean, people, <laughs> a few clients have stopped by. I was going to pop in your office. I was in New York. It's like they're uh -oh. mistaken. It's don't a UPS it. store. But um, no, I think it's something we celebrate now. And say, so, listen, this is we're able to get wonderful people all around the world who do work for us and uh, keep our costs down and you benefit as the client, you yeah. know? So yeah. that was, that's been the biggest shift, but from a personal aspect, I mean, my wife's now back in the office. She works for a, a technology company. She's back in the office three days a week and her schedule is a little bit more uh, structured. So a lot How of the, your youngest uh, kid, she's six, six. six okay. Eight. Yeah. So, I mean, they're both in school, the bus pickup, the, driving to after school activities and stuff falls on me. Um, but it works out well. That's fine. I'm, I have a lot much more flexible schedule than she does. So. That's great. And we do it ourselves. We don't have any nannies or anything right now. We live in a community where my wife walks to the train into the city. We can, our, our sidewalk actually goes somewhere. That was my prerequisite. I said, I, where I grew up, the sidewalk went to the next door neighbor's house, but you couldn't. it wouldn't take you to a place to get a piece of pizza. So when I moved somewhere, I said, I need a sidewalk that actually goes somewhere. And that's afforded us to only have one car. And I will uh, I will go as long as I can with only one car, Ian. Wow. <laughs> one car. <laughs> yeah, and mass transit. You get to use... Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you say your wife's using transit, good mass transit. That helps. I will say a lot of my neighbors and friends here, they're, they're on two cars, if not more. I said, no, man, I'm sticking to one car. We're going to see how long we can do it. So... <laughs> That's cool. Let's talk about some fun stuff with the with the family. What are the kids into these days? Well, Ian, I think if you remember, it's like I, I was never a sports guy. I didn't know anything about sports, right? If that, like, I, I never, I never owned a jersey. Anytime I was dragged to a professional sports event, it would be for like a work event or like Boy Scouts when I was little. But I was never, never my thing. Um, my son Jack, who you just met, Jack is an avid sports fan. Wow, Love. just totally random. You think you didn't like prime him for learn, that or anything? You didn't learn it from me, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Like the sport, the sports, like if I was in, like, I liked rock climbing, I liked, you know, a little tennis, I like individual sports. Jack has really, he just loves the Mets. He loves, everyone loves the Golden State Warriors. He loves, I mean, he loves any basketball, baseball, yeah. football, loves it all. He goes to bed, he listens to AM sports radio every night. That's hilarious. Yeah. WFAN every night. Wow. He asked me. He asked me what a Ronkonkoma was the other day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so as a result, we go to several Mets games. We go, we live near Seton Hall. So we go to like, you know, basketball games and things like that. Um, and that's so probably that's gotten you pretty into it now too, or I bet you enjoy you know, it. So I enjoy, I enjoy it through, I him enjoy at least. through him. He's so into it. And like, I think it's really neat. 
as a parent, particularly as parents of the young kids, and it's more rare when the kids are young, much less rare, hopefully when the kids are older, like when, a, when your kid can teach you something at a young age, like when your kid yeah. really teaches you something, not say, oh, great, great, Bobby. But when their kid can be like, and so Jack will always quiz me and teach me about who's like up and coming NBA stars, how many points, this, that, and the other thing, or like, you know, some of the more esoteric rules that I would not know. And so things like that. That's been a real, that's been really neat to have and share yeah. with him. You know, he knows Very more cute. than dad does about certain things for sure. Um, yeah. And your other child's a girl? Aria is little, yeah, she's right. six. I just uh, had my second kid who's a girl and I, I have known nothing about raising a girl or how I'm going to do this or anything. <laughs> like raising the son who likes sports. You know, that guy could uh, you're, you're, figure you're, that out, you're, right? Your your older one's a boy. Yeah, having one of each is, I think, a great gift because there because I think there is such a difference. There's just they think about things differently. I think you know biologically they think about things differently. Jack is very much like a dude. He's just very very much dude like. Um, Aria, even as a young age, is always thinking like four steps ahead. I think. There's a certain thoughtfulness that maybe who she is, but also some of it I think is got it's got to be. I think just girls think about hmm. things differently than than boys do. Yeah, like to our caveman, you know, ancestors. We just we just approach problems and things differently. So Arya is very funny. She's very creative, very artistic, very thoughtful. Always always thinking like three steps ahead, which has been fun to watch her as she's as she's matured compared to Jack. And they're just, they're different kids. They're just yeah. very different. And it's a blessing. I feel, I feel, we feel very, very lucky, you know, that we have that opportunity and that they're, they're good kids. Hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I don't know if it, you know, ask me when she's 13, man, my response may be very different. But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. Problems are easier right now. I think they're going to get harder. Yeah. Uh, I'm hopeful that the similar parenting techniques are, you know, could, could teach them both to be great kids. And then, that later in life stuff, I just won't have to worry about. Like, I'm sure they'll hate you and all the stuff that teenagers do, but hopefully they'll be able to handle themselves by then. I think, you know, someone, someone told me once at some point, you know, it's you as parents have less influence than their friends do. Mm. And that the thing that you can really work on is to make sure they've got a great group of friends. And like, you know, if the kids are surrounded by, by a solid group of friends, like you don't have to worry as much. Um, and so I think that that's kind of where, particularly as Jack gets older, he walks to school now by himself. He's got a group of guys he meets up in the front. They go muck about for 20 minutes before school starts, getting into mischief. Like, that's the thing that my wife and I think about. It's like, all right, you know, these two are great. These two are gold. Like, this other one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A little it's, questionable. It's amazing how you can see that stuff as parents, too, right? <laughs> You see, you see it immediately. I mean, you see that same kid that you knew when you were in fourth grade in a kid who's now in fourth grade, right? Because mm -hmm. the certain archetypes just remain the same, you know, it's like, <laughs> it might look a little different, but it's that same kid, you know? Yeah. So what about your daughter? What, is, what does she care about these days? Unicorns, the Simpsons. I shared with her a little, a little Portland fact. I told her when I went to Portland, I said, I went as an adult. And I had always known that Matt Groening was from Portland, right? Yeah. So, but then when I saw Wiggum Street, is what is it? Wiggum Street, Wiggum Avenue. Yeah, I think so. They're all. That's not a big one here. Yeah, but yeah, but all I, the other names are, are everywhere. I know. I, I loved it. I was I was freaking mm. out when I saw all that. So, um, <laughs> she very much likes The Simpsons and art. She loves drawing. I lived in a very small river town in New Jersey called Lambertville, New Jersey, which is across from New Hope, um, along the Delaware River. It was, it's a very big antique and art community. Has been for a very long time. I mean, hundreds of years. There was a New Hope Arts School of Art. Um, so there were a lot of artists and stuff who settled in the area and, and maintained that. And so I lived down there. And, and there's a great antique flea market I'd go to every week. And um, as a single guy, I, I wasn't dating anybody at the time. I'd go out to the bars. I'd hang out with these guys who were all antique dealers. And I, I hung out and learned a ton and really got interested in art and antiques. And, um, we, my wife and I started dealing art and antiques more aggressively during COVID. And so mm. we've kept that up. So we've got our own Instagram. We sell, we did Brimfield. We've got an event coming up in two weeks. I do all the framing myself, um, some minor art restoration, things like that. 
And so my, my daughter's, you know, she has access to a closet full of tools and materials and paints and all that good stuff. So she gets her hands dirty with that. Huh? How neat. Yeah. That antiquing thing is interesting, right? I didn't know that you'd gotten into that. I saw some pictures on your Facebook and stuff of different little weird art pieces, but it wasn't clear why, <laughs> uh, you know, so that's neat. So where do you guys find stuff? And then how do you choose what's going to be good? Everywhere. We go to a lot of house sales. Um, we, okay. So, so we, it's like a, it's like an everyday kind of occurrence. You're collecting things as you go about your, your life. Then you see it, you see a house sale or a state sale, yep. go pop yep. by and state sales, flea markets, some auctions, thrift store, lots of places, but it, it, it's really, you know, it's a lot of fun. You call that more of a hobby more than a business or how do you feel about it? It ain't paying the mortgage. Yeah. But yeah. So I'd say, I'd say, yeah, it's, it's much more of a hobby, but it really, it's our couple's activity. Yeah. Um, it was much more so during COVID, you know, we, it was our, it was like, you know, so if a couple goes out and plays tennis together or goes runs together or does stuff like that, like this is what we do together. Um, and we each bring something unique to the table. Um, my wife can paint, so she'll, you know, she'll touch things up or change, you know, and, and, and I'll do some more of the, of the woodwork and the, and the, um, and the restoration in that way. But, you know, we both come together around liking a piece, not liking how we're going to price it, how we're going to market it, how we're going to shoot it. It's been a fun thing. And when it stops being fun, we'll, we'll stop doing it, but it's still fun for us. It's an every day, every week thing. I'll get up on a Sunday morning at four, four thirty, and get to the flea market before sun up and be there and then come home and time to take the kids to sports. Wow. Yeah. Cause that's your main selling point is physically being there and like spending the morning doing it. Huh? have to do it yeah and it's it's become like church for me man i go in the sunday morning and it's like very meditative and 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 i listen to like a a a radio show podcast i used to listen to from back in ithaca days and they you know i listen to that and i'll i'll drive down it takes me an hour to get there and like i'm by myself right and it's 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 yeah or arguably i should be going for a you know a 10 mile run like you are something (laughs) yeah but something a a little more heart healthy than sipping a coffee in the car but yeah, we're, so. we're we're just in newborn mode now, so I'm not sure how I'm going to do anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Any Don't moment we... I spend away from the house, I feel is bad. You know, you, <laughs> you're, you're, still, you're still running. Yeah. Yeah. I've been uh, getting back into it over the last couple of years here. I've uh, did some ultra marathons this year and kind of gotten to really good shape. I like, promised myself I was like never going to get out of shape again, but I, I don't know if it's uh, hopefully I'm still sticking to it. Um, but I've had these like up and down paths over my over the last 20 years of getting into good shape and then taking three years and getting to be a, a dump, not real bad shape, but just like where I can't run anymore. I can't what's run an ultra, more than three what's miles. An ultra marathon. How many miles is that? Ultra marathon is basically just anything over a marathon, which is 26.2 uh, miles. So I did a, a 50 K and then, um, me and some friends did a non race. That was, uh, we ran around Mount hood, which is about 40 right. miles. We graduated with a woman who's, I see her, it's Marissa Lysak. No, I don't know her. I think she's 97, Cornell. She won some record or something. A friend of yours or just someone yeah, you, friend, you've heard I mean, about? Oh, no, no, no. A, fr- fr- a, fr- a friend. I wouldn't say a close friend, but a friend and someone I knew there. But I mean, she, someone posted something. I'm seeing where she won some 48 hour. In yeah, she ran. Okay, so here it was in 2020. A Marina Del Rey woman just broke the American running record. Marissa Lysak, 41 at the time, ran 243 and a half miles in 48 hours this month and set an American's wow. women's record. She beat the title by a little more than a mile. Dude. That's insane. Yeah. There's this cool race I just heard about a month ago or so that is not distance-based, but time-based. That seems really cool. Uh, that you run and you have to do this a loop. It's about a four-mile loop. Uh, every hour and then you just keep going until you're the last person left so you don't know how long the race is going to (laughs) be you just you stop when you can no longer go it's like it's like like one of those sitcom like dance-a-thons like the last man standing yeah and it seems totally i don't know just like a unique challenge or a different way to do a race um that's very personal very like you know it's not about speed or anything it's just about like endurance and mental endurance to can i put myself back on that line and start this loop again. And you come back each time to your tent or whatever, like, so you can change your shoes or, you know, get a snack or like, that's a nice part. It's like, you wouldn't have to carry anything with you really for that run part. You could go light 
and just do your loop and come back. Running has never been a pleasurable thing for me. I mean, I, I, I envy it. Like I, I, my very, very close friend of mine, probably my best friend lives, you know, he's a runner and we lived in New York together and uh, he'd go out, he'd go running and like, he, you know, he'd go in the city, he'd go to the park. I mean, he derives so, and still does derive mm. so much pleasure from running, right? Gets that high, just, he just feels good. Like it's just, I, I, to me, it was always like, I did it, but I might mean, do three, five miles, something like that just to keep my weight down. But then I never really loved it. I could, the second yeah. I got started, I couldn't wait for it to be over, you know? Yeah. I understand that feeling or it's definitely a, it's a tough thing to squeeze into the day. Sometimes it seems to take up a bunch of time. And even though it's like a pretty fast way to work out, like you, you know, doing a 45 minute run is, is pretty solid. Like that's, it's both a, a short amount of time and then you can take a shower, or, you know, change your clothes, you know, you can get the whole thing done in an hour. And it's a pretty good workout, but to train for this really long stuff, you're also doing a lot more than that. You know, it's, it's two hours. It's all, all these big, big time chunks. Uh, and it, it burns up a lot of energy and a lot of, a lot of the day. And that's, that's one of my struggles with it. And I don't know if I feel that exact runner's high, like it's kind of painful the whole time, <laughs> the whole time. It's, it's pretty painful. Does your wife, does your wife run too? She does some lately. She's more into, um, like hit workouts and, lifting weights and that kind of stuff. That's been more her jam for the last five years or so. Everybody did a lot of stuff um, over the pandemic, you know, working, working out was a little different. And then I don't know how it's changing coming back now. Have you seen any trends on that front? Other than like Peloton bikes being about 200 bucks on uh, marketplace. Other, oh other yeah. Than- <laughs> oh my oh. gosh. <laughs> Poor Peloton. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's tough, man. I mean, that to talk about it, like, and you think about that too, as you have kids and stuff and, trying to be physically there for them. And I think, you know, you and I are the same age. We've got young kids. By no means are we are we young parents. I mean, I think in the, in the history of world and maybe in, in other parts of the country, like, you know, you're a newborn guy's 24 years old, right? And so, like, your body's just much more able to keep up with, like, small kids. It's like, I, you know, I'm feeling it. Like, I've been on a on an effort to drop weight and to to be more active so that, you know, I'm, I, I'm able to be with my kids physically, um, you know, while they're still wanting to roll around the floor and do all that stuff and not have all the aches and pains that, that, that come with age. I felt that in working out too, or in like learning to be able to do this long distance stuff, it's all about stretching. It's all about recovery work and, and all that. The time I have to spend on that has increased, you know, with my age as well. So I, I think it's, you know, being in shape and doing that kind of stretching and recovery type stuff is kind of just important to being a parent at our age as well. Yeah. And, and I think teaching your kids that stuff. I mean, I, I just, I think if you start young and you do that stuff, you form those habits at a young age. Gosh, I think it makes, makes life a lot easier. Kids are totally like, they'll, they'll go out and they'll go hike together. They'll go run together. They'll go, I don't know if that, I don't know if that crossed our minds. (laughs) I remember the idea of running a mile, even through like middle school, running a mile was a big deal. And now, yeah, there's definitely kids that do real real distance races and stuff you know running 10 miles for we in high school we ran 10 miles like three times or something and it was like a huge deal it was like oh my gosh we accomplished this big thing and now definitely for me at this age it's nothing like that's an everyday run but uh i think for kids too they're they're doing a lot more i see them out in the forest i see that the cross-country teams and stuff just doing the same kind of runs i'm doing yeah well particularly where you are yeah i mean Think about yeah, where we're you in like are. elite elite trackville. Yeah, I you're, guess you're, so. you're kind of like yeah. where runners go, man. You know, like that's <laughs> that's where that's where, that's where they go, which is a, which is which is great to, to be out there. I think anywhere on the West Coast, more or less, like your your access to the outdoors and your ability to utilize the outdoors every day is such a much more balanced way to live compared to the Northeast, where you're on a you're on a treadmill or it's more difficult. What's Good. There? You want to go over to his house? Yeah, yeah, you can go over there. Oh. Just go, and I'll, I'll just keep your watch on you. By the way, the Apple Watch is game changing. Oh, see, so, so that's how you're doing it. You have an Apple Watch with a with a phone plan. Five bucks a month. Oh, is it just an add on to your phone, or a same yeah, new number, yeah. new number, different number? How's new number, work? new number through Verizon. It was five bucks a month. I think it was ten, and then it got discounted to five because maybe through Jessica's work or something. I don't know. That's amazing. But it is game changing. And I put it on like school mode during the day and it affords an eight-year-old the ability to go over to a neighbor's house. 
I you can, can track his location I can track where he is. Yeah, yeah. But more importantly, it's like, I can just ping him and say, Hey man, come home. Or like, you know, he doesn't have to go like use the, use, uses, you know, their parents. Nope. No parent, by the way, no one has landline anymore. So it doesn't even matter. So it's been amazing. Um, That's great. So eight or how old, I don't think my son can quite wear a watch yet, you know, reliably and then charge it up or anything. Like he's definitely not up to the, yeah. <laughs> the and skill he's not, he's not, And he's not Six, away from you. Eight? He's not away from you. Eight worked because Jack started to walk to school and people were buying those gizmo phones that are super locked down. They're totally, they're, they're too restrictive. And the Apple watches have come down so much in price. So like, you know, 200 bucks, 250 bucks, you get the, the lower end Apple watch. It's great. Yeah. Um, it's really, I can't recommend it enough. It really does. And it also, it also has kept him from pounding us for a phone which I will not do for the foreseeable future. Cause he can still look up sports scores on it. He can ask Siri, what was the score to the, you know, the Knicks game and all that stuff. But, uh, but he can't surf the web and I'll do all that stuff. So it's fun. Yeah. It's limited in what it can actually do. There's not a lot of games. There's not a lot of anything you can do on there almost, but you can get the weather, you can get sports, you can get a little news. You could yep. look at a few pictures if you're, if you care enough to really try. Hmm. Yeah. That's been, it's been great. Um, I guess the messaging is the key thing people might worry about is that, you know, they're going to just spend their time chatting with their friends or get too lost in that. He does. It's like, who can you come over now? I mean, that's fine. Which is what just happened. Hey, yeah. You walk over. It's great. That's it awesome. Have to do it me. I don't have to be his agent. Yeah. That sounds wonderful. I'm, I'm definitely going to, I have an old iWatch, Apple yeah. watch that I was going to try to do that with, but uh, it's good to hear that someone else is actually doing it. I'm not crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it is. It's uh, it's been very, it's been very helpful. So what are you what are you looking for? What's your next move? Um, so I have a bunch of different projects going on right now. I got these children's book things I'm working on. The first one it's called F is for Fan, and it, I wrote it because my son really loved at the time. He still loves he still likes them, uh, but fans, ceiling fans, that kind of stuff. Okay. <laughs> and I I was looking at some of the other books on Amazon. And they weren't that great, so I was like, let me just write another one. So I did it, and that was great. It actually sells still, which is like the surprising thing or the thing that's made me, I at the time thought I should maybe just write a whole alphabet of these alphabet books. And then I kind of got off of it. I didn't, didn't keep going. Um, but as the months have gone by, it's about a year and a half old or so. Every month it sells 30 copies or so, you know, or it sells like something mm-hmm. and, I, and I'm doing no work. I'm doing nothing to, to get those sales, no advertising or anything. So it makes a little bit of money. <laughs> but if I made 26 of them, you know, that could be a decent amount of money, right? And and it would just sit there and and produce, hopefully. So that is my background goal of like, yeah, maybe I could get this kind of like passive income thing going on with yeah. some legitimate content that people are enjoying and it's helping people, right? Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I have a, a video game that I, I made a few years back, maybe 2017 or so, for the Oculus Rift and for the VR headsets. And I've, for a while, wanted to both just continue developing it or develop other things in that that genre or the, um, the kind of the world I built. Uh, I've worked on a couple projects and have, you know, a whole bunch of code I've written and, and games I've designed that are unreleased. So I'm, I want to keep working on that. And I thought that was going to be my two main projects was one, working on this podcast and then on the side doing this video or, you know, this was this podcast would be so easy. It would be this kind of side project, and I'd be doing coding as my main, <laughs> my main hobby. You're living, kind of thing. But it's turned out this took way more time than I thought uh, for a lot of months, and uh, I haven't gotten to doing that a lot. Why doesn't everybody have one of those headsets in their house yet? It's a good question. They're getting so much better and good. Like this new Quest Three, this one that's sitting behind me on the on the table. Oh no, sorry, right above my head. Yeah, that I one see, sitting I there. See, yeah. yeah. It's really good, really easy to use. The pass-through cameras are really nice. The user experience is getting really good uh, of just like um, the new user putting it on and trying it out. There's still like more content that needs to be made and better, you know, more interesting content, but it is tough to say why people aren't getting in there more. There is no great, no great answer. (laughs) Like for a while, it was that it really takes you out of the world you know, you got to put this thing on and you can't see everybody around you and you're kind of removed from your house. I think this and like maybe the Apple Vision Pro thing kind of starts solving that of 
yeah, you're wearing a funny looking headset, but you can see other people, you can interact with them. Like it's really quick to flip the the camera in and out. And probably soon there'll be some smartness of, I think Apple might have even showed that off of um, if a person is there and they're trying to address you, it just automatically, you know, pulls them through to your vision so you can interact with them. So like that would help, but I, I don't know if that's the magic of, you know, it actually works and everybody wants to buy one. We talked a little bit about, you know, AI and what I do in, in market research and field research. I think that, you know, I think that that augmented reality and this, the ability to capture information from a headset like this, or like it's, it's going to be really game. That's going to be very game changing to what I do hmm. uh, is, is right. Is, is everyone's ability to collect all this peripheral information about experience. Um, and there are you know, market research tools like that that have been used in the past, right? Especially for shopping in stores, right? Where it's a, a pair of glasses or a camera the person's wearing. It's not mystery shopping, right? They, the person is known to be yeah. doing this activity in the store or often you'll do it for a customer. You'll say, you'll intercept the person at the door and say, hey, oh, you're shopping for computers? Wear this thing so I, and I'll record how you shop. And then, you know, the market research goes in the backs and analyzes Oh, they walked to this aisle. Then, oh, they looked. They went over to the this other section, and they came here. And I look, they looked at these two things, but they missed our whole display over there. So, yeah. Do you ever do you ever encounter this uh, company called Enviro Cell? This guy, no, I don't know that one. This guy created a Paco Underhill, and he wrote a book of like you know the science of shopping and why hmm. people shop, how women shop and all this stuff. And like they would tap into earlier days, right? They tap into uh, cameras on the ceiling and say like and try and do and just track people. Yeah. Like, you know, Ian walks into the store, he makes a left, he goes here, he, he lingered on this display for a while, then he went here and like, try and draw analysis based on based on that data. I imagine what you're describing is, is and eye of, tracking, right? Yeah, the stuff I was trying to do, it's like, you'll know, have a eye tracking glasses on to see which part of the shelf they looked at. I love long. that. Stuff, man. I yeah. love that stuff. I tried to sell a show, TV show called, I called it Experience Engineers. And I wanted the whole show to be on I, well, I'll, I'll back up a second. I got fascinated in college. There was a book that's now been out of print called Personal Space, which is all about where psychology meets kind of design and function. I guess, you know, what DEA, right? It's basically analysis and it would everything. And when they talked about the fact that chairs had an hour rating, right? That's a two hour chair. That's a three hour chair. And I love oh. that idea that a chair was designed or could be designed with a level of discomfort built into it, right? Yeah. So McDonald's puts in a chair that's a that's a 20 minute chair because they don't want you lingering there longer than that, right? All of a sudden your butt starts hurt. I gotta get up. Love that. <laughs> so it's like, what else is there out in the world where I'm being manipulated into spending more money, spending more time, spending less time? And I ran across another fact, which was like that the Floors in a Las Vegas casino are are slanted ever so slightly down towards the high value tables. So even though your brain doesn't recognize, you're kind of walking with gravity downhill, hmm. which is more pleasing, more pleasurable than walking uphill. So you're, of course, your body's going to naturally flow. So anyway, I tried to sell this sto- show. I called it Experience Engineers. And uh, suffice to say, it didn't go anywhere. <laughs> they said it was, at the time, they said it was very PBS. I said, well, okay, and then I'll sell it to PBS. But um, I would love to do that. Maybe YouTube. Maybe that's a YouTube show now. This was years ago. Um, yeah, you got to get enough of these examples, though, too. There are a ton of them of why colors are certain colors are used on walls, all this stuff. And then you get into like the really interesting things about what hospitals are doing to calm patients down. Um, who was that firm that did all the Apple? IDEO. So mm-hmm. IDEO was very involved with spatial design, you know, with the Mayo Clinic and designing how the, you know, they realized one of the findings I found fascinating is when they did their due diligence, right? And they t- took a patient who's being admitted to a hospital. What does a patient see when he or she's being admitted to a hospital? Staring at the ceiling. Because they're typically lying down on a stretcher on a bed being wheeled and the ceiling was just a drop ceiling. So why don't we actually add, you know, light changing panels that provides the illusion of daylight or evening hmm. time or things like that. So it's like, I love that. I love that thought, right? That merging of the technology and the, and the experience. Yeah. Yeah. Experience design. And I guess that's part of what, uh, 
your company and your work is looking at all the time is how are these experiences going, right? So it's at least your your mind I'm is always focused. It, not creating it, but yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, that's maybe one day I'll create it as well. But uh, do you guys delve into that path? Do you do like the strategy piece, or is it all just the reporting and measuring part? Is is coil goes just that far? We do we do measurement. Mm-hmm. Um, we help design what the protocol looks like. We help design what that instrument looks like. Yeah, but, design the uh, research. Sure, but yeah. but but we stop short of making recommendations, um, of providing training, of providing solutions it just feels like it feels like it crosses the line right i'm gonna i'm gonna tell you what's going wrong and then i'm gonna try and sell you a way to fix it mm. so we kind of stop short of that and say listen we're just the measurement component lots of great people we can recommend to help you solve it but it's not us that's good that makes sense yeah to have some separation there there's definitely too much of that of some of the companies that do the design or do the advertising creation or something right then they want to do testing it's like to say whether it's a good ad or not it's like well that's that's better yeah. done by someone, someone else, a separate company. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, absolutely. I wanted to ask about some other s- travel stuff, maybe. Yeah, good. So, is travel like a big hobby of yours, or is it a s- just part of the business and, and you know part of what Coil cares about? No, listen, tra- travels travels essential. There are a few things that you can do better with your money than than travel. I just got back from a trip. And exposing your kids and yourself to new cultures, new things, new sites are both restorative and I think helps us all to realize there's a much bigger world outside there. It's, it's you know, you get sort of see your worldview out your window and your town and your area for a long time. You start to lose sight of the fact that there's a there's a much bigger world out there. So mm. travel travel's so important to who we are. Any good travel stories or what's your... Uh best memory from the last the last 20 years here when i did travel spies was back this is a long time ago in 2006 2007 we would go undercover and if you can imagine at the time in 2000 it was all done on um digi beta the sony format hmm. those cameras were huge man i mean they looked like it like he was like the camera you see when they're when they're shooting you know snl like it's like i mean these cameras were massive not very and undercover we, yeah no and we would check in undercover and, you know, for, we're just here for two nights and it was like, we're coming in with, you know, with four bell carts of equipment, all, you know, <laughs> all in these cases, um, it was quite hard to keep under wraps. And on occasion, as we're shooting a TV show, quote unquote, undercover in these hotel rooms, you know, a housekeeper would, would not knock, or we didn't hear her knock, you know, would key into a room. And I mean, if you're a housekeeper and you come in and there you're, sp- you know, there's a couple checked into the room. And you see 14 people with lights and cameras in a room. <laughs> what do you think is going on in that room? You know, sorry. sorry. <laughs> so, um, there were a few of those instances. Um, but uh, my, my travel these days is with, uh, is with the two little kids. We just got back from uh, a vacation in St. John, U.S. Virgin Islands, which was mm. fantastic. Um, and it's great. It's great seeing. It's great having these experiences and seeing it through their eyes. Are you a fan of all the uh, travel programs? The, you know, do you try to follow all that stuff? The, sorry, like the f- frequent uh, flyer things or the you know, loyalty reward things? Are you way into that scene or is that not a? I'm not so, you know, I travel very, you know, we, we rented a house. I mean, I travel, I travel um, using very much independence, you know, independent properties a lot. Mm. Um, and uh, not that I'm opposed to staying in brands. I just, I like experiencing smaller properties generally. So I've never gotten into the points game, but, but certainly it's a big motivator. And I recognize that a lot of my clients, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big motivator for people and, uh, and a very hot topic for frequent travelers for sure. Yeah. I read this article in the Atlantic, I think it was about frequent flyer programs and how they were just like a big, they were a bigger money maker for the airlines than the actual operation of the airline because of, you know, they basically create this fictitious currency yep. and then sell it to the credit card companies and sell it to the, you know, like rental car agencies, sell it to everyone else. Right. And for real money. And then people don't even redeem it a lot or all these yep. like, tricks of ways that it actually is way highly profitable compared to just running an airline. We had an intern work for us one summer who, while at Cornell worked for a guy, another Cornell student, 
who created a travel agency where they where their whole value proposition was maximizing your points. So you'd go to them and you'd say, listen, I've got Amex points, I've got, I've got United, I've got whatever you have. And basically they build you a profile and they became so expert at not only what to redeem and when, but how to redeem it and for what types of benefits to hmm. maximize the bang for your point. I, I thought that was just genius. Hmm. Right. Like, like, you know, instead of you going on there and like we, I happened to exchange some points for our flights down to the Caribbean. My, you know, my brain is I look for dates. I say, oh, where's my redemption better? But I'm sure there's a much better way to do it. Much more scientific way to do it to really maximize value. Yeah. Another friend of mine who's fully into that reward travel scene. And yeah, there is a big <laughs> a contingent of people that track that stuff and talk about what the best deals are. It's definitely not my gig or, but, uh, I thought I'd check with you. So it's kind of related to mystery shopping and stuff too. I think of the travel programs and then like the lounges or at the, you know, at the airports and the the different things people are building. It seems like there's a lot of trends in that that are changing that I thought maybe you'd have some insight on of, you know, getting tougher to get into them or, or they're giving them out, giving access to more people or it's like, there's something weird happening in the travel industry with how you make premium products and, you know, reward travelers with them. I love that you brought that up, right? So I'm, I'm starting to work with a client who is in the lounge space. So you as a consumer of travel, what, so tell me more. So what do you see? You see more lounges, you see, what do you what, see? As a consumer, one thing I've seen is, you know, the way you get to get access to these things has changed over time. And, I personally, I don't see the huge amount of value in it all the time. My wife is uh, always uh, angling to to get into things, maybe more to like have a, a space to sit down that's uh, you know comfortable or you know easier to to hang out there for a couple hours in the airport. Where I'm more like, oh, I'll just sit here and be uncomfortable and save money, you know. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. um, but so one thing we've seen is how you know it used to be about flying a lot of miles in an airline that that got you status and then it was miles and segments now it's just there are segments and dollars or miles and dollars now it's just dollars um so they're they're kind of rewarding you on the thing that they really care about we want they want you to spend a lot of money with the airline i think that makes sense and it's probably a fine thing but it feels like as a consumer all the the barriers have just increased over time right? Like to, to get that status level where you could get into a lounge for free or that'd be part of your thing or, or else they're saying you should sign up for a uh, annual fee credit card or that kind of thing that maybe you can get, get some passes that way, right? It's all these, it seems like more and more people are getting in and more and more people are getting access and yet it's also getting kind of tougher to get in uh, at the same time. I, I, yeah, yeah. No, I hear what you're saying. I think folks outside of the airlines have started to monetize the lounge experience. There are, there are credit card lounges, which I guess there have been, but there are more of them. Yeah. Um, there are exclusive credit card lounges. And then there, there are the airline lounges. Maybe we'll look at an airport in 10 years and there is no more free seating by the gate. It's all lounges. <laughs> standing room only or something. Yeah. yeah, standing room only. And if you want a seat, you're going to have to be a member. Oh, you want to you be in a chair lounge? Yeah, well, you have to sign up. Uh, truly, I think that, that folks are just trying to monetize Mm. that real estate in any way they can. Wow. And I think the experience, the experience in general, in, in terms of lounges, and I'm not talking internationally, the U S lounges, unless you're in an ultra premium sort of lounge has always been pretty plebeian. I mean, it's, it's crummy cheese cubes. It's, you know, it ain't, I don't no, see much value over the regular. Yeah, so, no yeah, great like, uh, yeah. Yeah. So there really, there really isn't a lot of, of wow there. Uh, and all um, that being said, is the international lounges are some of them are absolutely beautiful, and the food product and everything is is astounding. I guess one of the values we see sometimes is it's just like quieter, or yeah. maybe it's cleaner, or that you know, in, in the pandemic times, you're you know, away from people a little bit more, maybe a few less coughs around you. I think I think like anything else, you're gonna have access to that if you pay up for it. I went on a first, I forget what flight I was on, it's Frontier or something. I took one of those airlines back and I, I couldn't believe that my seat didn't go back. Mm. I thought something was broken because why would, I mean, I, the seats were, she's like, no, they don't go back on this airline. I'm like, what are you talking? She goes, first 20 rows, you got to pay for that. 
I gotta pay to have my seat go back. <laughs> so I mean, maybe you know, you, you'll if you want if you want a USB plug, buy your share, you'll pay for it. Yeah, right. It'll be nickel and diming for everything, which I, I, I don't. Have to tell, it's just it's infuriating to me as a customer. And when I and when I sell my product, when I sell clients, and I say, listen, I'm like, you, there's no nickel and diming, right? You you want to make changes to your program, you want to do that. Listen, that's included. Because I can't stand that stuff my in my own life. I, I mm. really it drives me mad. Hmm. Very cool. Here's a totally different topic, maybe. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, one thing I was wondering about was your college experience and how that kind of influenced your life later on, or how you know, like we said, those four years are pretty formative and pretty important to us. And I really liked how you said that, you know, the waiters and the time that you and I spent together was actually like really important to you of all the experiences you had there. It's interesting to hear that or, or to see it play out in different people and how, like I didn't have a fraternity or I didn't have a lot of other things I was doing. And, and sometimes I might feel like I didn't, didn't do enough different things or should have had more, but it's like eh, the thing we had was, hey, uh, you know, was pretty important. Anyway, leading up to this call and I was thinking about it, I thought about how I only knew you through that mostly. I knew our, us. I knew you as my singing friend, and that was mostly what we spent together. We never talked about our schoolwork. We didn't talk about other work. We we didn't talk about our family as much. We didn't, you know, the, it was a very focused relationship. And I so it was with all the the whole group pretty much. So what I don't know then is like how it was all the other things you were doing in school that kind of led you on to where you are in your career now. What was your big feeling back then? And how do you look back on that time as formative to your experience now? I, I my, yeah. my, college, my college experience where we were there was by and large, extremely positive. I, I loved where we went to school. I took yeah. my family back on vacation there last year. We went to Ithaca. I love the area. I love, I love what I did there. I think what you're describing and how we knew, you know, it's like, perhaps it's like, that's what 19 and 20 year old guys do. They don't talk about their family. They don't, Ian, you know, how you doing in school, man? Everything good? Yeah. You know, how's class? Like you're struggling with anything? Like we didn't have, like, I just don't think our brains are formed in that way yet. Whereas if, if we were doing it today, you and I would sit down. It's like, so, so tell me about how the kids, man, how's your, how's your wife? How's your relationship with your wife doing? You know, like we're just, we're adults. <laughs> we're old guys yeah. now. It's like, yeah, yeah, you don't support each other that same way. So you think maybe it's a, a time thing. Maybe it's, it's a, I think it's maturity. I think it's a time. I think it's just it's just we're so inwardly focused on ourselves at that period, or at least I'll speak for myself. I think that like I was so inwardly focused on me, what was important to me, and sure to the group, but where it impacted me. Um, and and I think that you know for for a vast majority of folks, that's what it is. I think you have some people who are just sort of next level in terms of their maturity and thinking where they're, they're, they're beyond that at some point earlier in age, but that wasn't me. Um, so my experience was great. I, I do think about when I mentioned this earlier saying, I felt like there were a few paths with my fraternity, with the waiters to, to a less extent, Cornell to a large extent is that we went to school, present company included with very smart, very high functioning people. Right. I mean, think about the guys even in our direct group, like a Chris Wary or a Langseth or these guys. I mean, these guys, I, I mean, they're next level, right? I mean, these guys were, these guys are by all accounts, top 1% of sort of brain power and thinking and, and all this stuff. And so, you know, you and I are, I, we were surrounded by this. And I think um, the latitude that I felt, and I, I certainly am not in that, in that, uh, in that class. I think I have different strengths, but that's not, that's not me in terms of being that sort of what I would consider more sort of genius level. But I think where we were in the time of time of history in the U S where there's a lot of focus around investment banking money who, you know, it's a lot of talk in fraternity, particularly where I was, and maybe you weren't, weren't as exposed to this, but I certainly was, was who's going to work for what bank and do this. I didn't feel the latitude that I think I would have liked saying, I wanted to start my own thing, right? Nowadays, I think kids coming out of college and probably even high school, there's, a, there's an understanding that if they want to be entrepreneurial, 
They want to start something small. They want to make no money and sleep on a couch for a long time. That's okay, right? You can do that at 21 years old, right? I didn't feel that I had the the, the latitude to do that. And I think I missed something there. Yeah. I think I would have, I, if I had felt more confidence and supported by friends, family, those around me that I wouldn't say, what's, where's Gertman going to go work? How much is he making? It's a lot of that. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't even know you were, you know, I didn't know what you were going to do after you were in the hotel school. Like that investment banking was a thing. I didn't even know what investment banking was back then. It wasn't until like grad school for me that I really understood the the whole industry and the push for it. And like, I saw the kids cause then I was in that kind of business environment where yeah, a lot of people were trying to push for that. You didn't, but have I didn't know that was a hotel place they might feed it. Or maybe it was more of your fraternity. That was the group. My, my, my son's very into Mr. Beast right now. Okay. Mm. You ever watch Mr. Beast? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, so I see Jimmy being interviewed saying, what's the, what's the measure? How, what's the, what's the key to success? And he said, just do what you love and do it tirelessly. And that will become your career, right? Just do what you love. Do it passionately. Right. Listen, that worked for him. I don't know if that yeah, works this is for like survivorship bias here of like, yeah, he's the, the, be, the biggest YouTuber out there. And like, oh, yeah, just, just but to his it. credit, right? You know, he just he did what he did. Loved it. Right. Timing comes into play where you are. I mean, there's a lot of other factors. Yeah. But even if you take 10 percent of that to be true, I didn't see that at the time. I didn't have that model or to think. And I think that's what was missing from me personally. But as I said, you know, by and large, the school school was great. And I think the exposure to, I mean, the smartest people I've ever been around. Yeah. You know, you know, any I, regrets I, from that time or that? I always have regrets. Yeah. But yeah. I always regrets. Always have regrets. Yeah. Or anything interesting, I guess we should say. Yeah, <laughs> well, we, well, I, we always, we would make mistakes. I mean, and more, more, more with personal relationships and things like that. But um, yeah, I'm trying to think of this too. Like, what would I say to these questions too? Like, I'm not, I'm not sure. But I, you know, but for, but for me and the place where I was is like, I, I, I couldn't have asked for a better, I don't think I could have asked for a better college experience than, than, than what I had. I can only wish that my kids have something that approximates that. Cause I really did feel like it was, it was just, it was a great, it was a great time. It's, I don't, I don't know if it's the same now, um, but maybe it's better in different ways. I don't know. Yeah, it's probably fine. I don't think humans change that much. You know, we uh, <laughs> all the things the world is changing. We're still just people, and I bet the kids are having a great time and and going through the same kind of experiences we did or growing up. And they're just they're just learning. drinking a lot less and smoking a lot more weed. So that's what I understand <laughs> to happen. When I went back there, I'm like, "Where are all the bars?" They're like, bars are gone. I'm like, "Why?" They're like, "Because no one used the bars." Wow. Yeah, or I thought it just became like too illegal or something, or too difficult to get well, in. Well, there's or, you know, there's problems. Was, I think that in general from what I understand, and this is, this is not only true with, with Cornell, but with others is that the bars became used right around closing hours. But, but generally speaking, bars were a way for us to, to meet girls and for girls to meet guys or guys to meet guys or whatever it might be for people to meet someone else. Yeah. And apps did away with that. <laughs> so you maybe didn't really, need to go out, you did not need to go out to the bar to go meet somebody to hook up with. So, so bars really struggled and then you have the legalization of marijuana. And even though the kids might not be 21, there's just a, a plethora. And so kids would go to house parties. They'd smoke a ton of weed. Maybe someone would get a bottle of vodka. Um, and that's that. I mean, apps and communication. And by the way, remember, when we were in college, like only like Ash had a cell phone. So like you couldn't call your buddy. It's like, if I were going to go meet up, let's go meet up and rule off at 1245 and you hope your friends are there. It's like, you're not calling them before. Yeah. So it became a meeting meeting place. And that just was unnecessary after a certain time when cell phones came around. So hmm. um, couple that yeah. with the insurance and everything else. So Yeah, yeah. When I left in 2008 uh, from grad school, there was a vibrant scene whatever. And then I just went back for, like I said, for the reunion. And it was crazy. It's just like all Korean restaurants and... That was it, basically, like bo boba tea shops and and you know Korean barbecue. I was like, it's oh, depressing too. I found college college town looked like it looked skeletal. I mean, it really it really looked ratty and like it just didn't. And I started to think like maybe it was like my twenty year old mind, like it looked super vibrant. But my parents went there like, oh, <laughs> like, I don't know. But I think it just did not look. 
it looks very it looked very different huh. yeah hopefully they're they're probably doing something fun hopefully they're not just sitting in their dorm rooms all the time oh they're, they're having fun by the way so before <laughs> we before we wrap up do you, do you talk yeah. to lang seth at all do you talk to those guys i haven't yet I, wary i've talked to a little bit a couple times over the last few years but but yeah have you what about you I, ash i speak to periodically I saw Mickey probably most recently. He was in town doing his book reading for his children's book. You all, nice. you guys are all writing children's books. Um, <laughs> Which one is that? His uh, the bedtime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scary yeah. time or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And then we did actually watch Pitch Perfect over vacation with the kids, and they loved it. And Mickey was in the city once, invited all of us. Were you around? I don't know where you were. Were you around for? And that? we sang at a wedding. I remember that's that one time. That was a long time ago. No, this no, no. Thing. This was like when, when, when Pitch Perfect, they had a screening for Pitch Perfect. Oh, awesome. No, so it, they, wasn't, it wasn't like the real either. screening. It was like at the AMC, but he had like a private screening, but there was not like there was press there. And we all went, I was like, I think Jessica was with me and it was awesome. And I remember I was like, Mickey, that was a great movie. And I was like, he's like, no, no, stop. I'm like, I'm like, dude, it was really, really great. And I meant it. And I was like, I was like, you're, you're going to make a killing off this. He goes, nah, nah. He goes, I don't make this much. He goes, in the off chance they make a part two and a part three, he goes, then I'll make some real money. He goes, oh, really? Happen. <laughs> oh, great. I've never got to talk to you about that. That's wonderful. I was wondering, like, it, yeah, did it make financial uh, impact I on think his life? Said, but it was like, I, I remember it. He's like, he's like, dude, he's like, if they ever make a part two and if they make a part three, he goes, then I get some real money. I'm like, and then I saw it's like two and three comes out. I'm like, good for you, buddy. What good a strange you. contract. That is so interesting. Especially because like being based on the book, you'd think it would be the the first one was where you'd get the big, <laughs> the big. I killing. think when they probably sell him in the agent, right? They probably say, listen, we're going to give you a little bit of money for the part one. He goes, if we make a two, God yeah, forbid, sure, if we ever make sure a three, we'll, a few percent, we'll pay so. everything. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. It really is. Oh wow! Yeah, and I looked. I looked up Langseth the other day because I think it was after you. You reached out. I was like, I was like, what's Langseth doing? He's like, is he still making like spy fish? Like, what's what's? (laughs) What are you making spy sharks? Did it say? Yeah, did it say? Like, maybe he's doing some kind of secret. I don't know. I think I think he's teaching at MIT. Okay. Wow. I mean, that's what I mean. Like, you guys, like, you know, there's nowhere. There's nowhere else in, in, at least in my life where, and you know, it's smart people around and stuff, but like, not, not to that, not to that level of like being at Cornell and like, and also the diversity of, of people like in, in terms of where folks were from. And, uh, it was a great school, man. I mean, you got ag yeah. school, you got the guy who lived across from me in my fraternity grew up on a massive industrial apple farm on the border of New York state and Ontario, Canada. Hmm. And he was in ag school and he was going to school to learn how to basically modernize his parents' apple orchard operation. Yeah. And I was just like, that dude is at the same place as, you know, you and me and I'm learning how to, you know, hotel school is like, what a cool place. (laughs) Right. Like what a cool place. It was great. It was great. Yeah. I, I, when I went back for grad school, it was kind of to, add on to that experience or to try to do things a little differently in some ways. And definitely I met a, a ton of great people then, or the business school is a tighter unit, right? This class is only 200 people or something and you really get to know them well. And you're, you're, it's just a way different unit. You're, you're going out to the bars all the time with them, or you're like doing all the this recruiting events with them. And then you do all the classes with them. It's just like this tight group. So it was really fun to make friends that way. But yeah, after that, coming out here to Portland, it is tough to find a social group. I think it's I think it's really hard too as a as a as a dude. I think it's easier. I think in certain ways it's easier for women. Are you in a place where you have like neighbors and shit where you can Yeah, yeah. We this neighborhood we moved to is pretty nice. We've made friends around the neighborhood here and and I think we're gonna join this Mac Club. It's a you know, social slash athletic club around here that has a lot of events that we're hoping to like yeah. build a little more network through that. Yeah. I think, you know, so, I mean, then you'll just start playing pickleball and that's where you'll meet all your friends. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what people seem to do. I, I, I that's right. You asked me what, what is the sports trend? It's pickleball. Obviously. Of course it is. Um, yeah. I think, I think if someone can crack middle-aged guys and friendships and all that stuff too, I think that's a business that, uh, that would take off. It's a, it's a tough one. I think guys our age struggle with that. Um, Quite a bit. 
Yeah. I feel fortunate. We live it. We live in a community that despite it's, and it's got a lot of flaws in terms of the taxes are ungodly, but, um, in general, I think they're like-minded people. And when I think about every time I pay that quarterly tax, I'm like, where else am I going to live? You know, it's like, where else am I going to go that I know of, right. That's close to the city. My wife works in New York. So it's like, but it's, it's, it comes down to, so you're having like a neighborhood and and a group and then, um, and then activities and things like that. I've met some folks and I, I'm surprised running. I said, all these guys run together. I see a lot of guys running, cycling together. I feel like that's where I missed out where you, you can probably excel. Yeah, I think I've met some people through running for sure. And you can, yeah. you know, build those up over time or any activity you do that you keep going to, like you talked about the, uh, the fairs you go to on the weekend or the, the flea markets, like, you know, you, the people in the stall next to you become your friends. It's like, you gotta, you gotta go to where the people are that you want to be friends with. If those aren't the people, then you should do a different activity. Yeah. <laughs> That's where I'm trying to come to in my life is like, hey, what are the right activities to find these people of like-mindedness? Yeah. All right. So let me, let me ask you this before we wrap up. So number what's, what's, what's a number one or top video games you've been playing lately? What's, what's good that would, that would satisfy an amateur player like me? Oh, okay. Um, oh no, you can give me your top nerdy ones that is like super high and then, and then, then dumb it down for me. Yeah, so the big ones that have been out lately that I spent a bunch of time on were Starfield and um, there's a Dungeons and Dragons one that I'm forgetting the name of right now that's super huge. Or it's Baldur's Gate 3, I think. And yeah, so the, if you really want something to sink time into and be crazy nerdy about, that's kind of the place to go. And those are all what, PC games? Yeah, yeah. And then uh, on PC also, I play a bunch of Halo Infinite. That's like my go-to just... Throw, throw a, a quick little first-person shooter game together. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that is not the stuff for you. If you're going to be playing games, you probably want to do mobile stuff. And on mobile, I mostly do uh, Marvel Snap, which is a card-collecting battler that you can play on the toilet real easy. And, you know, each game is a couple minutes long. And okay. then, you know, you move on. Do the next thing. Well, it was great talking to Jeff and uh, likewise, man, really, really good, really good reconnecting. You look well and uh, you. you too. I'm trying, dude. That was one of my main goals of this podcast and everything, too, is just to reconnect with everyone and kind of, um, you know, see what comes out of it. By the way, I should say, share the good intel piece. So like when I was uh, when I was 13 years old, I had my bar mitzvah and my dad was always an investor, um, was in the stock markets and says to me, he goes, well, Jeff, he's like, you know, you really got to get involved. So. Um, you know, pick something that you're passionate about. Mm. So I remember this guy was 12 years old and I was very much like into like all this, all the Sierra games at the time, you know, like King's quest and all those, like yeah, I love. I right? So played those on my gateway, 2000, 386, 33. And so but you gateway wasn't a publicly traded company. Like the only thing that I was like, think of was, there was an Intel chip inside 386, 33. So I was like, dab by Intel. So I, I remember I got $6,000. And I bought six thousand dollars worth of Intel stock. Nice. In this is the right 19- time to do it, too. Nineteen ninety-two, right? Yeah. So time went on. I still own some of it, but basically, time went on. I paid for a down payment on my house. Like wow. it did well. What made me thoroughly depressed was when I said, "What if I had had an Apple computer instead of a PC in nineteen ninety-two? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I should not have run that math. <laughs> No, no. I saw this article. Um, it was what if instead of buying an Apple product at every release, you'd bought the same amount of money of stock. Genius. And yes. it's like, yeah, you have billions of dollars now. <laughs> yeah. I, I was just like, you know, Intel's been very, very kind to me. But damn, man, if only I'd had like a, you know, a Mac at that time. It was so passionate about Macs. That's hilarious. Damn it. All right, man. Well, listen, really, really wonderful connecting with you again. You too, Jeff. Thanks for the time. And uh, yeah, talk to you again yeah, soon. I hope. Thanks a ton for listening, and don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope you learned something, and I'll see you next time, friends.